cross my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree welcome you <laughs> to Calvary Christian Fellowship for our Good Friday service. We are glad you are here to remember our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's continue together in worship as we remember. We're going to share in communion later as well and I believe have 
a deeper explanation of the communion elements like a Seder and hopefully it will take you deeper into the understanding of that as we uh, reflect on our Saviour together.
before you what can we bring to you what can we give the lord of lords the king of kings the one true living holy god we are humbled when we think of your humility lord jesus we worship you lord in spirit and truth and in remembrance of what you did lord we pray as we here tonight gathered together lord open our eyes in fresh ways to the truth of who you are we know it goes beyond what we can comprehend lord but i pray you would speak to us tonight refresh us maybe those who've walked with you for decades lord that there'd be just a fresh um, lord a fresh remembrance of you a fresh view of you lord a refreshing lord from you tonight lord we remember you lord jesus come and lead us in your word and your truth as we look to you together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we'll take a seat together. If you've got a Bible handy, turn in your Bible to the book of Luke, chapter 22. And while you're turning there, you know, it was uh, many moons ago. 
Uh, right around Easter time in 1973, when I, as a non-believer, attended a Fellowship of Christian Athletes meeting at my high school, believe it or not, my football coach, who's also my physics teacher, ran the meeting, so I figured since my playing time and my grade needed all the help they could get, I'd show up uh, for his gatherings. But I'll never forget that day. Uh, he read an article from the Journal of the American Medical Association on the physical death of Jesus. And I have to say, that was a real eye-opener for me. My view of Jesus and his suffering prior to that time was maybe like some of yours. You know, the stained glass images, the uh, waxwork carvings, uh, the, the skinny northern European-looking guy hanging up on a cross, maybe a couple of drops of blood, but I look it up and saying, well, I can handle it. But after hearing that Jesus was so savaged before he got to the cross, that you could hardly recognize who he was as a human being any longer. I'll tell you, I walked out of that gym that morning with a lot of questions on my mind. Probably the biggest question was, why did Jesus have to suffer like that? He seemed like such a good man. I was willing to concede at that point that he was a good teacher. And what a tragedy of history that he had to go through so much. But the answer to that question is not something that we should leave to human speculation. We will only get the answer to the question, why did Jesus have to suffer so brutally when he died on the cross? By revelation. That is, by letting Jesus himself explain what was going on to us. And in Luke chapter 22 tonight, uh, really, uh, this is a Good Friday service. The event we're going to be examining tonight took place on Thursday. And it was immediately leading into Jesus' betrayal and the events that would unfold. But it really gives us a good handle, not just on why Jesus had to suffer, but who Jesus really is and how much it means to have a relationship with him. And that's, that's my prayer for each person here tonight, that we would walk out of this place on a Good Friday with a better and fuller understanding of the width and length and depth and height of the love of Jesus and who Jesus is, not according to culture, not according to tradition, not according to religion, but in reality. Luke chapter 22 and verse 14 begins with these words, when the hour had come, he sat down with his 12 disciples with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Now, in this brief passage, I believe we get the answer to that timeless question. Why did Jesus have to suffer in the way that he did? Well, the first reason I believe that we need to understand about Jesus suffering for us is to understand something about Jesus that sometimes can elude us, that Jesus cares about us personally. He not only cares about us personally, he cares about us on a level that is hard for us as human beings to wrap our minds around in many ways. In verse 14, uh, we see this. Now, uh, we, now uh, again, uh, when the hour had come, he sat down with the 12 disciples with him, and he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now, notice the language that Jesus uses here. Uh, the New King James Bible that you may have in your laps or are familiar with talks about fervent desire here. I've desired to experience this with you. But the language in the original is incredibly strong. For instance, uh, the word translated desire is uh, the Greek word epithumia. It is the same word that is translated in most other places, Lust, a very strong desire indeed. 
Now, in most cases, when we hear the term lust being used, we tend to think of it as something that leads us off the path, something that leads us into darkness, something that leads us into self-indulgence. But all it really means in its essence is a strong desire. In fact, it is even used to describe the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives as believers. In Galatians chapter 5, we are told that the Spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh against the Spirit, and these two are in opposition, so you do not do the things that you desire. So Jesus is saying that this particular incident that he is entering into, this particular gathering he is having with the disciples is one that he has desired to have with great fervent desire. With fervent desire, I have desired. He's not stuttering there. It's for a point of emphasis. And you know, I think this can put to bed once and for all this notion that sometimes we have in the back of our minds that uh, you know, maybe it gets communicated to us by so-called holy people. The people who are holy that people are close to God are somewhat different than us. Well, maybe they are in a lot of ways, but they're different in the sense that they're distant. They're different in the sense that they're disconnected. They are so high up spiritually that they cannot possibly relate to what we go through. And yet here we see Jesus demonstrating to us a great sense of, a passion within his heart. Did you know that Jesus operated at full capacity when it comes to the realm of human emotions? For instance, in the book of Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8, we are told that Jesus was anointed by God with the oil of joy more than his companions. Do you know what that passage is saying? It's saying that Jesus is the most joyful person you'll ever meet. On the other side of the coin, in Isaiah chapter 53, we are told in verse 3 that Jesus is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. You see, from one end of the emotional spectrum to the other, Jesus demonstrated these emotions. And, you know, it's not our emotions that get us into trouble. It's what we tend to do with them that messes us up. You know, your, ser- your emotions are excellent servants. They're poor masters. They, they, they can't lead you anywhere good. But God gave you the capacity to feel. And Jesus is feeling intensely at this moment. Now, this raises a really important question. Why is Jesus so passionate at this point? Sometimes, uh, I mean, maybe it's part of your uh, Easter weekend uh, routine and ritual. You watch Mel Gibson's famous movie, The Passion of the Christ. Well, here we see the passion of the Christ. Here we see Jesus being incredibly passionate about what? For with fervent desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus was passionate about sharing what was called the Passover with his disciples. Now, in the Jewish calendar, and many of you who are Sunday School 101 grads, know that Jesus was crucified on Passover, that he fulfilled a type of being the Lamb of God God who takes away the sin of the world. But what was Passover all about, and why was Jesus so uh, intensely interested in celebrating it? Well, way back in Exodus chapter 12, we see a description of what Passover was all about. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, this month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for his household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to this house take it according to the number of persons. According to each man's needs, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a mule of the a male of the first year. You shall take it from the sheep or the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lentil of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat of the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its heads, its legs, and its entrails. 
You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. What God was saying to the people of Israel at this time was, this is the feast you're going to have every year at this time. This was the first one being described here in the book of Exodus chapter 12. And the people of Israel were instructed to take a lamb. They were to take the lamb into their home, take that lamb in kind of long enough to sort of bond with it in a sense, uh, to kind of have an affection like you would have with a house pet, and then slaughter that lamb, take some of the blood of the lamb, and put it on the lentils, that is the top part of their entrance to the house, and on the doorposts on either side. And we are told that when the final plague that was going to be unleashed against Egypt to let the people go, the killing of the firstborn, by the angel of death. When the angel of death would see that blood on the doorpost, it would pass over them. Now, notice there were certain foods and certain procedures and processes that the Lord wanted the people to follow. And down through time, year after year, when the people of Israel would recount this liberation, if you will, this being set free from the bondage of slavery in Egypt, they would have this kind of a celebration. And over the years, there were different practices that were made a part of the Passover Seder celebration. You've heard of a Passover Seder. The word Seder literally means an order, an order of service. That's what a Seder is. So uh, this Passover that Jesus intensely, passionately wants to celebrate with his disciples. Why do you think that mattered so much to him? Why was that at the top of the list as far as Jesus was concerned? Well, I think for a few reasons. First of all, you have to understand something. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation chapter 1 that Jesus is the one who was and is and is to come. He is God. He has been there from the beginning. In essence, he was there when the first Passover was implemented. And when that first Passover was implemented, as we're going to see, there was more afoot than just a commemoration of the deliverance of two and a half to five million people out of bondage in Egypt after 400 years. There was going to be a greater deliverance that this would foreshadow into the future. It would take 1,475 Passovers to get to this place in time we're reading about in the book of Luke here today. From the time Passover was implemented to the time that Jesus said, with fervent desire, I've desired to have this Passover with you. It had been a long time. And boy, sometimes, and I think this is a really important thing for us to keep in mind when we think about God's plans for our lives, God certainly operates on a different timetable than we do. Could you imagine how many Jewish people lived their entire lives? And part of the Passover uh, celebration, by the way, is the anticipation that Messiah could come. Uh, in fact, in the modern Passover celebration, they always keep an extra chair at the table for the prophet Elijah in case the prophet Elijah comes to bring in the kingdom of God as the forerunner of the Messiah. Could you imagine how many generations came and went thinking, why don't you come now, Lord? You see the desperate circumstances we're in. Why don't you send your Messiah? Why doesn't Elijah come through our door at our Passover Seder? Boy, doesn't that sound familiar? We find ourselves, the more we see this world getting crazier and crazier all the time, and we say to ourselves, Lord, why haven't you come? What needs to happen. You know, again, the old saying is true. If the Lord doesn't come soon, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. 
But the, the, the bottom line, though, is this. God is patient, and he has his timing, and it's perfect. We are told that there's one main reason why Jesus hasn't come back yet. It's found in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness, but is patient towards you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So 1,475 Passovers came and went. <laughs> and we think of the Jewish people anticipating that. But what we see with Jesus' passion here tells us something else. There was no one more interested in coming at the right moment, at the right time to fulfill everything in this Passover than Jesus himself. And may I say to you, there is no one who is more anxious to return and right this world gone wrong than Jesus himself. But maybe, just maybe, he's waiting on one more person to give their life to Jesus before he comes back again. One more person who's not going to have to go through the hell on earth the Bible prophesies that is awaiting this world. And boy, we sure see the stage being set. And you know, I, I think of uh, how many people perhaps in 1972 were praying the same thing. Our country was in a pretty crazy place back in the early 70s for sure. How many people were saying, Lord, why don't you come back now? I'm glad he didn't because I wouldn't have gone. Maybe you wouldn't have gone either. Maybe you weren't even born then. I'm really dating myself here. But the bottom line is, at just the right moment, in just the right time, Jesus' passion, his overwhelming desire, with fervent desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you. Now, what caused Jesus to be so amped about the Passover? What was it about this ritual that we see described in the book of Exodus that lit his fire so much? Well, there's an interesting insight into this that we find recorded in the book of Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, we see the description of one of the most cosmic events in Jesus' ministry. It was his transfiguration. And uh, again, uh, we see that when Jesus uh, took two of his disciples up on a high mountain to pray, as he prayed the appearance of his face, this is Luke chapter 9 and verse 28, his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, there's so much we could get into as far as this Mount of Transfiguration revelation of Jesus, his face shining like the sun in its brilliance, his clothing as white as lightning, suddenly Moses and Elijah show up. And we were told they were discussing something very interesting with Jesus, his decease. Do you know that in the original language in Greek, uh, the word decease is really interesting. You know what it is? It's the Greek word exodon. We get our term exodus from that. Now, I would have loved, loved, loved to have been a fly on the pine tree <laughs> on that high mountain listening to Moses and Elijah and Jesus describe his exodon. In other words, his setting people free, not from political or physical slavery, but spiritual slavery and the consequences of spiritual slavery. Death itself. They're describing this thing on the mountain. Now, this exodon, remember where we get our instructions regarding the Passover, it's right there in the book of Exodus. Could be that Moses and Elijah and Jesus were talking about how all the pieces of the puzzle, all the things that we see in the law of Moses, all the prophecies and predictions of the prophets were coming together at that incredibly powerful and intense moment. But understand something, Jesus couldn't wait because what he was about to do and what he was about to explain was going to take 1,475 years of partial, foggy knowledge and bring it into crystal clarity. Notice what happens. He said, I've desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now, notice he makes a prophecy here. He is not going to celebrate the Passover until the kingdom of God comes. Do you know one of the things that we are going to experience when Jesus returns, when we come back with him, when he sets up his kingdom, is we're going to sit down and have a meal with him? 
It's called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb in the book of Revelation chapter 19. And part of that meal, I believe, is going to be going through the Passover Seder when the one that the Passover Seder, even the one that is practiced by Jewish people who don't accept Jesus as the Messiah, even that particular set of rituals is going to come vividly alive. And when you start to see what the Seder was all about, uh, it, it is just such a profound thing. Uh, there, there's a great article on this on the gotquestions.org website. And I just want to give you some of the highlights of what the Seder is all about. Now, uh, again, uh, this is a sort of preview of coming attractions. But next year, uh, we are going to be bringing in a representative from Jews for Jesus who is going to explain in vivid detail what the Passover Seder is all about and how Jesus fits into it. Till then, you're going to have to settle for uh, second best, some Gentile up here trying to tell you all these Jewish things. But uh, the, the bottom line, though, is this. As we saw in Exodus chapter 12, the first thing that in, was involved with the Passover Seder was the slaughtering of a lamb. To this day, during the Passover, in the Passover dish that is at the center place of every uh, table at a Passover Seder gathering, you will find the bone of a lamb that is roasted. It was to remind the people taking this in of the blood of the lamb that was applied to the lentils and the doorpost. Another interesting detail there when you stop and think about it. The blood applied to the lentils and the doorpost. The lentils was the toughest, uh, topmost part of the door. The lentils were on the side. Boy, you connect the dots. What do you see? The cross. So, first of all, <laughs> it would involve this lamb. And, and understand something. The instructions of the original Passover specified that the lamb's bones could not be broken. How interesting that Jesus' body was never broken. His bones were never broken, according to John chapter 19 and verse 33. Another really fascinating insight is something that we'd like to talk to you all about when we have our regular communions here at Calvary Christian Fellowship. It is the presence of matzah, or unleavened bread. Now, right after Passover, there was a feast of unleavened bread that would take place for a week, and part of the preparation for that was sweeping away even the slightest crumb of any bread that had any yeast in it. Yeast is always a picture in the Scripture of hidden sin that doesn't stay hidden for long. Uh, a little tiny piece of corruption that spreads itself out and causes bread to rise. Well, even the slightest crumb had to be swept out of the house. And for a week, you'd be eating this. We've got a picture of this that we can put up here uh, on the screen, this matzah that we have here. And there's a couple of aspects of this matzah that are really fascinating. First of all, this is the bread that you would eat at a Passover Seder. But notice something about this bread. First of all, it's pierced. It is pierced in its preparation. Secondly, it is also striped before it's baked. The other thing is there is not a bit of yeast in it. Now, stop and think about what this represents. The Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, uh, some very interesting things about Jesus. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has gone to his own way. But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all, the sinlessness, the stripes, the piercing of Jesus. Now, when you ask a Jewish person, why do they prepare matzah like this? Nobody knows. They just do it that way. They've always done it that way. The other thing that's fascinating about the matzah in the Passover Seder celebration is that the matzah is presented in a really interesting way. Can we see the, the uh, slide that has the uh, linen covering for the matzah on it? There it is. This is referred to as an echad, believe it or not. Now, the word echad, uh, along with giving you a great opportunity to spit and clear your throat if you want, but, but the word echad in Hebrew means one. 
it is a word for oneness. Now, there's two words for one in Hebrew. One is the word yakid, which means one well, and only one. My matzah is falling apart on me. But it means one and only one. But the word akad is different. When God said to Adam and Eve that the two shall become one flesh, he uses the word echad, because echad refers to a oneness that is composed of more than one part. When the people of Israel came back from scouting out the wilderness, and they had one huge uh, bunch of grapes, that was one huge uh, thing of grapes, but the word they used to describe it wasn't yakid, it was echad, because it was a bunch of grapes, grapes, one bunch of grapes. Now, how fascinating that this word echad, or oneness, is used in the Passover Seder, because you see this uh, kind of package, this kind of protecting sort of thing here. It has a huge, huge part in the Passover Seder. In the Passover Seder, as you see in this picture, three pieces of matzah are placed inside, three compartments, in what is called the echad. Uh, the fascinating thing is this. Uh, many Jews today say, well, you know, why do they put three matzahs in the echad? Well, some say that it uh, represents Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the uh, very fascinating procedure that is involved here is uh, something that really can stir us up. This akkad, this one in Hebrew, is a bag with three chambers. One piece of the matzah is placed into each chamber of the bag. The matzah placed in the first chamber is never touched, never used, and never seen. The second matzah in the bag is broken in half at the beginning of the Seder. Half of the broken matzah is placed back in the akkad. The other half, called the afikoman, is placed in a linen cloth. That linen cloth is then hidden somewhere in the room, and the children get the opportunity to search for it later in the Seder service. The third matzah in the bag is used to eat the elements in the Seder uh, plate. Well, the meaning of this ritual is kind of hard to miss when we start looking for clues in the New Testament. It is a picture of the doctrine of the Trinity. Because you have an akkad, you have one container, if you will, with three places for the matzah, if you will. One of these, right, the first matzah remains in the bag throughout the Seder. It represents Ha'ab, the father, who cannot be seen with human eyes. The second represents the rock, uh, I should say, the uh, second matzah, the broken one represents Haben, the sun. The third represents Rok HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. The reason the middle matzah is broken is to picture the broken body of Jesus. The half put back in the akkad represents Jesus' divine nature. The other half wrapped in a linen cloth and separated from the akkad represents Jewish hum Jesus' humanity as it remained on earth. The linen cloth that wraps the second piece of the matzah suggests Jesus' burial clothing. In the Seder, the linen cloth with the afikoman inside is hidden after dinner. The children look for it. Once it is found, it's held as a ransom. Again, we see these rituals point to Christ. He was fully God, yet fully human. He was broken for us. He was buried, sought for, and resurrected. And his life was given a ransom for many, the Scripture says. You see, Jesus was the completion of this beautiful new covenant that God has for us. So there were other elements of the Seder plate that are traditional reminders of the Egyptian enslavement to the Egyptians. There was a vegetable called carpus, uh, usually parsley dipped in salt water and eaten. There were the bitter herbs. And boy, if you go to an official Seder, I want to tell you something. Uh, they usually get out the atomic level horseradish because they really want you to weep when you have this, uh, the bitter herbs. There's also a part of it called Hereseth, which is a mixture of apples, nuts, wine, and spices. It represents the mortar that Israel used in constructing the buildings and the slavery to the Egyptians. You would also have a hard-boiled or roasted egg. Traditionally, in Jewish culture, hard-boiled eggs were always eaten by mourners. Then there were four cups of wine 
used at various points in the Seder. This is really important to understand because you will never see communion the same way after you see this. The first cup is called the cup of sanctification or the cup of holiness. The second is the cup of judgment. The third is the cup of redemption. And the fourth is the cup of praise or the cup of joy, as it's known. At the Last Supper, notice what Jesus does here. Verse 17 of Luke 22 says, Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Well, people say, well, that was Jesus doing the first communion. No, it wasn't. That was Jesus beginning the Passover Seder with the cup of sanctification. In other words, God's people were going to be set aside to have a special living relationship with him. From that time onward, we see Jesus leading like a good rabbi, his followers, through the whole Passover Seder ceremony. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them and said, this is my body. Now notice, he took bread and he broke it. Remember we talked about the afikoman? Where did it come from? It was the second piece of bread in the akkad taken out and broken with half of it being put back. This picture of Jesus, divine nature as God and his human nature, being willing to be broken for us. But notice he, gave, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper. Now, the supper is referring to the Passover Seder celebration. The Seder celebration is over at this point, and now Jesus is going to do something very profound. He took the cup after supper and said, this cup, after going through all of the cups of the Seder, this cup is different from any other cup you've ever had. And remember something, the disciples are thoroughgoing good Jewish boys. They, 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 they had been to many, many Seders in their life. They understood the routine. They understood the ritual. But now Jesus is changing the ritual. There's another cup that has entered into this process here. He took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. How do you realize what a mind-blowing statement that is? Jesus said, this is the new covenant. Who had the right to make covenants with God's people? Only God. Only God could do this. What covenant was Jesus speaking of here? Well, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, we see this predicted. In verse 31 of Jeremiah 31, we read, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the hand of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. Now understand, he's referring to this covenant that the people of Israel celebrated and ratified every year at their Passover Seder. They were reminded of the goodness of God and how he delivered them from slavery and bondage, but they were also reminded every year of their incredible lack of faithfulness to the covenant they had made with God. But God, through the prophet Jeremiah, said, I'm way ahead of you guys. I understand you didn't keep my covenant. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. Who's making the covenant? The Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. Do you understand the mind-blowing thing that Jesus was saying to his disciples? What he's saying is, I'm making this covenant with you. Right now, at this moment, the new covenant begins. The covenant that can not just take away your sins and give you cleansing from 
all of the promises and all of the failures to keep the promises that the people had made under the old covenant, not just forgiveness of sins. God says, I'm going to do you one better. I'm going to give you a brand new heart. And this is how you receive it, by putting your faith and trust in God's ultimate Passover lamb. See, that's what communion is all about. You know, sometimes I, I think we get so used to a routine. We have communion here uh, the first Sunday of every month. And woe be unto you if, if you don't have communion on that first Sunday of the month. There's people like, well, you know, we're not into routines. and rituals, But where's my communion? I don't know what I'm going to do with it. It's not having communion every month that matters. What really matters is you understand what that communion represents. Stop and think about that word for a second. Communion. What does that mean? Communing with God. Connecting with God. The true and living God, the holy God, the one who is perfect and pure and all-powerful, who if he were to reveal himself in his reality right now. You talk about Jesus with his face shining like the sun and its brilliance, his clothing like lightning. That would probably cause everybody in this room to pass out. But stop and think of what this is saying. Because of what Jesus is doing, we can have connection with God. We can have fellowship with God. We can have friendship with God. All that separates us from God, taken away by the Passover lamb. As John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus coming toward him, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I want to tell you tonight, that's your sin. That's my sin. That's the sins of all mankind because Jesus was not only a perfect man laying down his life on the cross, but he was also fully God. And because he was fully God, his sacrifice is of eternal value. Past, present, future, every sin ever committed paid for. All we have to do is put our faith and our trust in Him. So when we take communion, and we're going to do that right now, when we take communion, what we're doing in a sense is an acted out sermon. You get to preach a sermon, if you will, by your gesture here tonight. It's not that somehow magically this bread becomes the actual body of Jesus, although some churches teach that. What matters is understanding what this represents. What matters is understanding what lengths God was willing to go to to pay the price for your sins and for my sins, that Jesus died for you personally. And when you take this bread, what you're saying in the act of taking this bread is, I'm entering into this covenant with you, Lord. I believe that you have provided a way for me to have forgiveness of sins and fellowship with you. And by taking this bread, I believe personally you died for me. You were striped, you were pierced, your holy, sinless life laid down for me. That's what that means. And if that's not what this means to you, then don't take communion. Because this is only for those who've taken God up on his offer of forgiveness and entering into life paid for by the Lamb of God who shed his blood, and yet not a single one of his bones were broken. When you take the cup, what are you doing? You are, in a sense, ratifying the fact that you are entering into that connection, that covenant, if you will. You've read the terms in Jeremiah chapter 31. Here's the condition. You put your faith and your trust in Jesus, and you believe he shed his blood for you. The Bible tells us that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins because the life of the body is in the blood. It costs Jesus his life to forgive you your sins. And so when you drink that cup, please, whatever you do, don't just do it because everybody else is doing it. Don't do it because you've always done it. But when you take that cup, what you're saying is this, I believe your promise and that your promise never fails, Lord. I believe that you are a God of your word. 
And when you say, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. When you say, I have eternal life, I have eternal life. When you say, I've been adopted into your forever family, I believe that. And you literally signed that agreement in your blood. As you drink that cup, you remember the awesome price Jesus was willing to pay. And it kind of comes back to that, that day in 1973 when I walked out of that gym. Going, Why did he have to suffer so much? Because there was no other way to save us. There's a lot of people in this world, a lot of people who say, well, you know, whatever floats your boat, whatever way you want to follow to God, that's great. Just be sincere. But if sincerity was all that mattered, and it really doesn't matter which way you take, we're all going to get there eventually anyway. Can I ask you a question tonight? Why did Jesus have to die? He died because there was no other way to save us. That's why he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. When you take that bread, when you drink that cup, think about what you're doing. Because Jesus is psyched about this relationship. He's passionate about this. Are you passionate about this amazing relationship with God Jesus has made for us? with the, his own body and his own blood. We're going to sing a song of praise and then get ready to take communion together. So prepare your heart and ask yourself this question. Is that how I approach God? Is this how I approach communion? Don't settle for anything less. Lord, thank you that you've shown us in your word in that, that awesome first time of celebrating communion what communing with you, connecting with you is all about and the awesome price that was paid and 1,470 Passover seders were celebrated until it all came together. Your exodon, your setting us free from sin and self and Satan, from death itself, paid at such a price. Lord, as we prepare to receive communion now, help us, Lord, to just have a laser-sharp focus on what you've done, not on what we've done or haven't done, or even on this act somehow making us righteous. But only, Lord, let us put our faith and our trust in what your Son has done. May we have a brand new way of looking at communion, your covenant, your new covenant, written on our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's prepare for communion. Yeah. 
The Apostle Paul wrote, For that which I received from the Lord, that I also delivered to you, that Jesus Christ, in the night he was betrayed, took bread and broke it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat this bread, do it in remembrance of me. Let's take this bread and remember the awesome sacrifice of Jesus. Grace flows down the covers me. 
in the same way after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my shed blood. As often as you drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. Lord, thank you that you've given us this timeless reminder of the blood that was shed that saves us and sanctifies us and keeps us saved. Help us to receive this as the priceless gift that it truly is and so honor you in some small way for that ultimate sacrifice that saves us and sets us free. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take the cup. You broke my chains of sin and shame and you covered me. so grateful that we've had this chance to remember the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. But your word says that if he had stayed in that tomb, then our faith is useless. Uh, we're still in our sins. 
If Jesus isn't risen, we are above all men most to be pitied. But now you have risen from the dead. And Lord, we look forward to anticipation, celebrating on Sunday that amazing event in history that changed our lives, changed this world, changed the universe forever, the empty tomb. So Lord, we pray that as we leave this place and even as we go about our day tomorrow, uh, we would be preparing our hearts for you anew and afresh to be able to speak to us your life-changing truth that Jesus is risen, he is risen indeed. Thank you, Lord, for this blessed hope we have in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you. Remember, 630 uh, for our sunrise service. Don't worry about the weather. We've already made plans to move it here inside, which some people kind of like because it'll be a little more comfortable. Um, so 630 a.m. for the sunrise service, 9 o'clock for our second service. Uh, still time to invite a friend on out and uh, let them be touched by the love of Jesus this year. Let's pray for a great harvest that God is going to accomplish in our midst. Let's join together one last song of worship. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Listen that again. My hope is built. My hope is built.
Through the storm, He.